welcome to this fine Monday morning and welcome to the Roman Empire. So I will just pull up my screen share and we will get the Roman Empire ready to rock and roll. Marvellous. So today's talk is going to be about ancient Rome and the early emperors. So we will start the slideshow. From the beginning, excellent. I will pick up my little pointer as usual and we will begin. So during our time together this morning, we are going to be thinking about the Julio-Claudian dynasty of Roman emperors who consisted of the first five Roman emperors, their names and the dates that they reigned are there on screen, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. And Nero, the last of the emperors, is the subject of a big exhibition opening at the British Museum this month. Now, these five emperors ruled the Roman Empire from its formation under Augustus, Augustus in 27 BC until AD 68, when the last of the dynasty, Nero, committed suicide. Now the name Julio-Claudian is a term used by historians derived from the two families which make up this imperial dynasty. And the five emperors themselves were all closely related through family, marriage and adopted relationships. And we'll hear a bit more about those as we go along. Now we're also going to be looking at the development of Rome itself this morning as a settlement, as a city, a republic, and finally an empire. So we're gonna begin with early Rome, then royal Rome, republican Rome, and finally imperial Rome and our five emperors. Nowadays, Rome is the capital city of Italy and it sits near the east coast of the Italian peninsula. There's been a settlement on the city site for almost 3,000 years, making it one of the oldest continuous occupied cities in Rome. And if we look on the map to the right, you will see the seven hills of Rome to the east of the river Tiber. And these form the traditional geographical heart of Rome throughout its history. And the urban limits of the city in ancient times were considered to be the area inside the city's Servian Wall, which was built around 380 BC. Now, Rome gradually outgrew the Servian Wall, and in AD 270, the Emperor Aurelian began building the Aurelian Walls, which the city spreads away from extensively nowadays. But when people talk about ancient Rome, in essence, they are talking about the settlement which began and grew centered around the Seven Hills of Rome. Later on, areas away from the Seven Hills, such as the marshland area, known as the Campus Martius or the Field of Mars, became part of Rome's imperial history. Now between 2000 and 1000 BC, people began to settle near the River Tiber. And these people were farmers who built small settlements on the Palatine and Equestaline hills close to the river. And at this time, one of the main trading routes on the Italian peninsula ran across the river Tiber near these villages. And as a result, they grew wealthy from trade. And during the 8th century BC, the villages on the hills joined together to become a single settlement. And this settlement gradually became larger, developed into a town, and this was the town of Rome. Now, buildings in the early villages were timber built with wattle and daub walls and thatched roofs similar to this pottery funerary urn 
found in the Alban Hills, which are 12 miles southeast of Rome. Now the urn is in the form of a round hut and dates from around 900 BC. It is built with timber poles and beams and represents the sort of hut that would have had a wattle and daub outer wall. And you can also see that there are poles laid across the roof to keep the thatch in position. And just above the door, there is a smoke vent for letting out the smoke from the central hearth that would have been positioned in the middle of the interior of the hut. The urn was found with a polished ware pottery jar. You can see it here to the right, the handle and most of the mouth is missing. But what I particularly like about this jar is that on the bottom, it has its original handwritten label, which was added when archeologists found it in the Albion Hills in 1817. And this was added when it was first entered into the British Museum collection and has now become part of the history of the object itself. The early Roman villages were ruled by individual village rulers and it wasn't until the villages became one settlement that they got a single ruler. Now the early settlement at Rome was influenced by its neighbours, the Sabines, and Rome itself was ruled by both Roman and Sabine kings. Then in 600 BC, Tarquin I took control of Rome and turned it into a city. And from 1616 to 500, sorry, from 616 to 510 BC, Rome was ruled by members of the Tarquin family. And the Tarquins were actually Etruscans from a region north of Rome. And the Etruscans lived in a number of cities, each ruled by its own king. And it was Rome's position at that bridging point on the Tiber, which meant the Tuscans in controlling Rome got access not only to the region around Rome, but to other regions south of their city states. The Etruscans introduced writing to the Romans, although the Romans kept their own language. And the stone foundations and tiled roofs in the city first date from this period. And at the same time, that marshy area of land between the hills and the river was drained. And areas of land between the hills themselves were also drained and were used to lay out public squares and this became Rome's first forum, the formal city centre. There was also a palace for the king, temples and a city wall. And the earliest recorded bridge in Rome was a wooden bridge built over the river Tiber in the 6th century BC. And what we have here are two objects from Rome dating to the period when it was ruled by the Etruscans. We first of all have a decorative roof tile probably from a temple to the goddess Juno, built in the region around modern Rome. And then next to it, we have a Etruscan drinking vessel made from a fine, smooth, dark coloured clay with a polished surface, surface. And this was a very typical type of Etruscan ware, which was distributed throughout central Rome and also exported further afield. It's mostly used as tableware, it's fine pottery for serving, eating and for storage vessels. And you'll see that it has stamped into it around the rim a frieze with a winged figure, a duck, animals and also a sphinx. And again, it dates to the period when the town of Rome, later city of Rome, was ruled by the Etruscans. Reign of the last Etruscan king of Rome came in 510 BC when the Tarquin family were expelled from the city and the monarchy was abolished. 
At this point, Rome became a republic ruled by the Senate. This was an assembly of leading Roman citizens who discussed matters of state and passed laws. And each year, two consuls were elected from amongst the Senate's members to rule as heads of government. They served for one year and were advised by the Senate. What we see here is a silver coin of 134 BC during the Repu uh, Roman Republic. And it shows us a winged victory on a two horse chariot holding reins and a whip. There is an ear of corn and on the other side, we have the helmeted head of Roma. Now, in ancient Roman religion, Roma was a female deity who personified the city of Rome and more broadly, the Roman state. And this idea of the Roman state was portrayed through different media, such as the coin we see here, sculptures and designs in architecture. And the Romans aimed by putting depictions of Roma on the coins that circulated amongst the population of Rome and nearby regions to encourage the idea, not only of an identity as citizens of the city of Rome, but also the idea of a strong Rome that would prevail over her enemies. So a bit of propaganda carried on the coins that people were using in everyday life on a daily basis. By the fifth century BC, Rome is an important city and as it grew powerful and wealthy, it began to extend the area it controlled beyond the existing settlements and started to establish colonies of Roman citizens in regions around the city and began to take control of some of the Etruscan cities that had themselves once ruled Rome. Then in 390 BC, Celtic people from Central Europe entered the city of Rome and destroyed it. Romans rebuilt the city, providing it with better defences. And after this setback, they began to expand into surrounding areas of Italy. And it was during the Samite Wars against the powerful Samanite people of central Italy that the Romans, the Romans managed to extend their control all the way across to the eastern side of Italy to the Adriatic Sea. So that eventually Rome controlled the whole of the Italian peninsula either through political alliance or direct conquest. And what we have here is the end part of a bronze sunlight belt with hooks in the form of male figures wearing rather uh, knobby, tall, curled caps. And behind their feet is a reinforcing bronze strip which has punched and in size decoration. And both the figures and the strip are attached to the buckle. It's probably part of the buckle belt with small rivets, which you can see on the strip and also on the chest of both figures. And next to this, we have a Roman object, a pottery lamp decorated with two gladiators. And these gladiators represent a Samanite warrior and a Greek hoplite. And the inscription below gives the name of the two, the names of the two gladiators. Now, the Samanite gladiator was a type of Roman gladiator who fought with equipment styled on that of the Samanite warrior. Short sword, rectangular shield, a greave protecting the, sh the shin, and a helmet. And they appeared in Rome shortly after the defeat of the Samnite people. And arming low status gladiators in the manner of a defeated foe was a way for the Roman people to mock 
their enemies, the Samnite, and also appropriate military elements of their culture into Roman culture. Now, at this time, Rome also began to take control of land beyond the Italian peninsula. And it was during the Punic Wars against the city of Carthage in North, North Africa that Rome won control of the island of Sicily, its first overseas territory. Rome's victory in the Punic Wars also gave it control in North Africa and land around the Western Mediterranean Sea. And then the defeat of Greece in 146 BC opened up the Eastern Mediterranean, which meant that Rome now controlled most of the land around the Mediterranean Sea. From about 150 BC, as Rome's territory grew in size and wealth, various powerful people tried to take control of the Republic of Rome. And in 44 BC, the Roman general Julius Caesar, who we see here in this marble bust, took control as sole ruler. Now he had begun his career as a general in the Roman army. After his time as a general, he began a political career and became a consul working for the Roman Senate in 60 BC. Then in 59 BC, the next year, he was appointed governor of areas of land controlled by the city of Rome in northern Italy and southern France. And it was at this point that he decided to conquer the whole of Gaul, modern France and Belgium, and make it part of the Roman world. It was during this eight year campaign that he led two expeditions to Britain in 56 and 55 BC, although Britain was not to become part of the Roman Empire until almost 100 years later in AD 43. In February 44 BC, following a period of civil war between Julius Caesar and his political rivals, Caesar had himself appointed permanent ruler of Rome. And in this coin of 44 BC, we see Julius Caesar wearing a laurel wreath with an inscription which declares him as Emperor Caesar and greatest priest, a most powerful person within Roman religion. On the other side, we have Venus holding victory in her hand. And this is probably an attempt by Julius Caesar to show that with his control of Rome and his appointment as sole ruler of Rome, he is going to bring peace to the Roman Republic. However, his power grab worried many in the Senate who thought that Caesar was about to elevate his position from ruler of a republic to king. And therefore, in, on the 15th of March, 44 BC, he was assassinated. And in the aftermath of his assassination, power was held by a triumvirate of three powerful Roman political leaders, Augustus, who was Julius Caesar's appointed son, Mark Antony, and Marcus Lapidus. When this political agreement collapsed in 33 BC, civil war broke out between the most two powerful members, Antony and Augustus. Antony created a power base in Egypt, where he'd already established a political and personal alliance with the ruler, Cleopatra VII. Meanwhile, Augustus won control of Rome and all its territories in 31 BC, and this included victory over Mark Antony and Cleopatra in Egypt. He thus became sole ruler, and this time the Roman Republic indeed came to an end 
as Imperial Rome emerged. And it's the story of Imperial Rome, the story of Augustus and the other Julio-Claudian empires, which we are going to follow after our 10 minute break. So we are now going to have a 10 minute comfort break, after which I will see you again to continue the history of the first emperor, Augustus. Welcome back everyone, and we are going to dive straight into the second half with Augustus. And we heard just before the break that in 31 BC, Augustus became sole ruler of Rome. At the same time as he became sole ruler, Rome was changing and Augustus was able to consolidate power as an imperial rather than a republican leader, making use of some changes in the nature of government which had actually started during the time of Julius Caesar. As part of this process, Augustus presented his victory as the end of civil war and the beginning of a new era where a newly imperial Rome would rise above all other cities in the empire. And four years later, in 27 BC, the Senate granted Augustus the titles which officially made him the first Roman emperor. The Senate continued to give advice about how the empire should be run, but it was now under the control of an emperor. When Augustus died, he passed the title of emperor to his adopted son Tiberius, and Rome was ruled by emperors for the next 400 years. Now to the left of the screen, we see a cameo portrait bust of Augustus from around the time when he became sole leader of Rome and the Empire. He is shown wearing a laurel wreath, triumphant, and also veiled with his toga. Now a toga was a roughly semicircular piece of cloth, about three and a half to six meters long. It was draped over the shoulders and around the body, usually woven from white wool, and worn over a tunic. And the type of toga worn reflected a citizen's rank in the social hierarchy. And over time, various laws and customs evolved, which restricted the wearing of togas to elite citizens who were required to wear them for public festivals and whilst performing civic duties. This coin of Augustus shows him bareheaded, but with an inscription which now proclaims him not only consul in the Senate for the seventh time, but also Caesar, son of the divine. And on the other side of the coin, there is an Egyptian crocodile with an inscription which says Egypt captured the conquest of Egypt. And Augustus reformed the way in which the government worked and secured the frontiers of the empire, bringing peace and stability to the Roman world. At the same time, he ordered building works in Rome with new building projects running alongside the restoration of buildings neglected during the final civil war of the Republican period. He built a new forum to serve as the legal and administrative centre of the city and had many existing buildings faced with marble to give them a grander appearance. He was also a patron of the arts and his reign saw the production of Roman literature by writers such as Horace, Virgil and Livy. At the same time, the Romans continued to expand the territory they controlled and built an even larger empire. Augustus, Augustus, as we know from the coin, had made Egypt a Roman province in 31 BC, and emperors after him 
added further territory throughout the first century AD. The Roman Empire actually reached its greatest extent under the Emperor Trajan, when the Romans controlled territory in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And the year 117 AD is usually seen as the year when the Roman Empire was at its greatest extent. The next emperor, Hadrian, consolidated the frontiers of this empire. And after his reign, there were only small additions to the territory controlled by the Romans. These territories were controlled by Roman governors who commanded the troops in that territory and were responsible for local law and order. Each governor had a staff of slaves and military clerks to help them administer the province. Now these provinces brought Rome great prestige and wealth from trade. They also provided food. The city of Rome was a consumer. There were more people living in the city than the surrounding agricultural land could support with agricultural produce. And for example, the province of Africa supplied two thirds of Rome's corn. New towns and cities within the empire had Roman style bathhouses, temples and public forum built and Roman citizenship was gradually extended to people living in these provincial towns. People from the provinces soon joined the Senate and the emperors Trajan and Hadrian both came from Spanish families. Various provinces were also well known for their specialist goods such as the beautiful Samian ware produced in Gaul, the marble imported from Greece, whilst the province of Spain was well known for its olive oil and fish sauce. Romans were also keen to explore beyond these provinces. Uh, Nero sent an expedition to modern Sudan, and in AD 166, an embassy from the Emperor Marcus Aurelius reached modern China. Rome itself became a showcase for Roman building technology and the art of construction was both a source of wonder and a mark of civic harmony. Whilst the emperor's ability to reshape the landscape was an indication of imperial power. So the first and the second centuries AD saw much building activity in Rome as emperors built new public squares adjacent to the original forum. The last and largest of these was Trajan's Forum, which had law courts, libraries, government offices, a temple, a shopping centre, with a large column in the forum to celebrate Trajan's military victories. The Colosseum, which was begun in the AD 70s, was to become the largest amphitheatre ever built by the Romans, seating more than 60,000 people. And Roman ideas about building were recorded in books written by ancient architects and engineers. Now, this coin shows a colonnaded building with an inscribed architrave and on the top of the pediment we see victory standing on a globe with warriors to either side and this building is the Cura Julia, the Roman Senate's meeting place in the Forum and this building also illustrates an interesting fact in that when we talk about construction projects by emperors and in this case the dedication of this building took place on the 28th of August 29 BC, so under Augustus, but its construction actually started under Julius Caesar. Building projects take many years to come to fruition, and in fact Augustus's contribution was to add the front portico to the building 
before it was de dedicated and declared open in 29 BC. The pottery lamp to the left is decorated with a chariot race in the Circus Maximus at Rome. And the Circus Maximus had probably started construction under the first Etruscan king of Rome, when it was probably a racetrack out to the east of the small settlement, the small town of Rome, through the countryside. Gradually, seating was added around the trackway, and it was under Julius Caesar in around 50 BC that seating tiers were added so that they almost encompassed the entire circuit of the track to create a spectator capacity of around 150,000. And we can see some of these spectators shown here watching the races on the lamp. The wooden tiers, the original seating was damaged by a fire in 31 BC, and it was probably repaired by Augustus who then had an obelisk, which we can see here lower down in the scene on the lamp, brought from Egypt and set up midway along the dividing barrier of the racetrack. And this acted as a permanent reminder of Augustus's victory over his Roman foes and their Egyptian allies, who of course had numbered amongst them the Roman Mark Antony in the recent civil wars. Now the arrival of Imperial Rome, the elevation of Augustus to the position of Emperor, created an Imperial family at the top of Roman society. Before becoming Emperor, Augustus had married his first wife in 40 BC and they had a daughter, Julia, in 39 BC. The following year, Augustus fell in love with Livia Drusilla, and it has been suggested that the representation of the goddess Sulus on this coin is a portrait of Livia. Now, Livia was married, as was Augustus. They both divorced their, their respective spouses and married. Marriage lasted 31 years until Augustus's death. There were no children from this second marriage and therefore the children in the Imperial Palace were Augustus's daughter by his first wife, Scribunia, and his two stepsons, Tiberius and Drusus from his second marriage to Livia. Now Drusus entered the army and became a trusted general and he married Augustus's favourite niece, Antonia. And they have three surviving children who we will meet later on in the story. Drusus himself died in 9 BC while on campaign in Rome, and sorry, in Germany. His brother Tiberius also served in the Roman army and his conquests in Northern Europe established Roman provinces in the region and laid the foundations for the Northern frontier of the empire. He married Augustus's daughter, Julia, as his second wife in 11 BC and was adopted as Augustus's heir in AD 4. When Augustus died in AD 14, a month before his 76th birthday, Tiberius, aged 55, was confirmed as his sole surviving heir and the next emperor. Now, the other object we see on this slide is a sword and sword scarab with a detail showing the scene at the top of this gilded bronze scarab. And it shows the seeding, the handing over of military victory to Augustus by Tiberius after a successful Alpine campaign. Augustus himself sits flanked by victory and Mars, again representing the military might and the expected military success of the Roman state 
while Tiberius, in military dress, presents him with a smaller statue of victory. And this sword and scarab were almost certainly commissioned for a senior officer to commemorate a victory in the lengthy military campaigns in Germany. And victory in these campaigns was essential for the extension and protection of the empire and the symbolic act of presenting the victory to the emperor avoided competitions between powerful generals which had brought down the earlier republic. Tiberius was not born as an heir to Augustus and indeed Augustus's first idea for establishing an imperial dynasty was to arrange a marriage between his daughter and his nephew, the son of his sister Octavia, and make his nephew his heir. However, his nephew, Marcellus, died two years later and no children were born to the marriage. Julia then married Agrippa, a soldier, and trusted supporter of the emperor. And they had two daughters, Julia and Agrippina, and two sons, Gaius and Lucius. And these boys were adopted by their grandfather with the intention that if Augustus died, Agrippa would rule until one of them was old enough to rule themselves as emperor. And Julia, and her two sons are shown on this coin of Augustus, who was father and grandfather. To his two grandsons, who he declared as his heirs. Now, unfortunately, Agrippa died in 12 BC with both boys aged under eight and shortly before the birth of a posthumous third son, Marcus. Now, Augustus, wanting to declare a strong successor, rather than promoting the idea that he may possibly be succeeded by a small child as emperor, turned to the elder of his stepsons, Tiberius, who it was now decided must marry the recently widowed Julia. Tiberius was already married, was ordered to divorce his wife and marry Julia. They had one son who unfortunately died in infancy. By 6 BC, it became clear that Tiberius was being set aside. Julia refused to live with him and her son, Gaius, now a teenager, was given a nominally high appointment as consul in the Senate. Tiberius, disillusioned, withdrew from politics and retired to Rhodes. However, Julia's sons, both of them, died young. Lucius in AD 2 and Gaius in AD 4. And Augustus was once again forced to turn to Tiberius, adopting him formally as his son and successor. Marcus, the brother of Lucius and Gaius, was adopted by Augustus as a possible heir, but was banished from Rome and murdered by one of his own guards in AD 14, shortly after the death of Augustus, probably for political reasons. So none of the three sons of Julia and Drusus, shown on this coin, survived and Tiberius, the elder stepson of Augustus, became king. But this marble bust of Tiberius marked his adoption as Augustus's heir and in it, Tiberius appears much younger than his 46 years, giving the image of the idealized Roman ruler. Now, Tiberius was not a willing 
imperial ruler, and he actually expected the Senate to lead on decision making. In AD 22, he decided to share his political powers with his son from his first marriage. His son unfortunately died the next year, AD 23. And as Tiberius became more embittered with his position, he began to depend more and more on the administrators left to him by Augustus. And then finally, in AD 26, decided to retire to a villa on the island of Capri. The empire continued to run under the imperial bureaucracy rather than the leadership of the emperor. When Tiberius died, aged 77, in AD 37, he was succeeded by his great nephew, Caligula. Having an emperor now made Rome the capital of an empire. It was home to people from across the Italian peninsula and the imperial provinces. The population included the imperial family, the nobility, the senatorial class, the equestrian class, the business owners, imperial administrators, the Publarian working classes who made up the majority of the city's population, freedmen and slaves. And this population included adults and children and the object you can see on the screen is a pottery rattle in the shape of a pig, has a serrated ridge running along its back and is set with green blue and yellow glass inserts on each side of the ridge and four eyes. And you can also see that there is a broken snout. Originally it would have had a little snout and there is a small hole set into the side of the rattle uh, into which small pebbles or dried seeds could be dropped to allow it to make a noise when it was shaken by a small child. Now, modern, estimates, modern attempts to estimate the population size of Imperial Rome are not accurate. And they range anywhere between 50,000 and a million. Although all of these estimates still make Rome one of the largest pre-modern cities. Exact calculation is hindered by variations in ancient sources, which are themselves due to changing definitions of who counted as a citizen to be included in a census, particularly after AD 100, and the extent to which only the male sector of the population were counted. The population of Rome was probably relatively stable during the reign of the first five emperors, with a densely populated urban area within the Aurelian walls, but little major settlement outside this area. We now come to the third emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, the Emperor Caligula. Now Caligula, formerly known as Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, was the son of the Roman general Germanicus and Agrippina, who we met earlier, the daughter of Augustus's daughter, Julia. So Agrippina was a granddaughter of Augustus. Gaius acquired the nickname Caligula, which means little boots, from his father's soldiers during campaigns in Germania. When Germanicus died in Roman Syria in AD 90, Agrippina returned with her six children to Rome, where she became entangled in a bitter feud with the then Emperor Tiberius. This conflict eventually led to the death of her two eldest sons and her own death in AD 33. Following the death of Tiberius himself in AD 37, her third 
and youngest son, Caligula, became the emperor. As emperor, Caligula declared an annual public holiday as a day of remembrance for his mother, whose image was paraded through Rome in a covered carriage similar to the vehicle on this coin of AD 37 to 41, which features a portrait of Agrippina with her hair knotted in a long plait at the back. Below, oh sorry, to the left, to the right, dear me, get my positions correct. To the right, we have a bust of Caligula's father, Germanicus, in military wear, probably made in Egypt during his lifetime. The nose has been damaged, probably in late antiquity, by Christians who have also cut a cross on his forehead. Now, Germanicus's mother, Antonia, was the daughter of Augustus's sister, Octavia. His father was Tiberius's brother, Drusus, who had died on campaign in Germany in 9 BC. So as well as being the nephew of the Emperor Tiberius, he was the father of the Emperor Caligula, brother to the Emperor Claudius, and maternal grandfather to the Emperor Nero. In AD 33, Caligula married Juna Claudia, though she and their child died in birth, childbirth around AD 34. This copper coin of AD 37 to 38 shows the new widowed emperor Caligula and his three sisters. We have Agrippina, named after her mother, with her hand on her sister Drusilla, and then on the third side, the third sister, the third daughter, Julia. On becoming emperor, Caligula, who's shown on the other side of the coin, married his second wife, Cornelia Orestina. However, he divorced her after only a few months so that he could marry his third wife, Lolia Paula, who he again quickly divorced in order to marry his fourth wife, Melina Cesania, who was pregnant with their daughter, Drusilla. Now, as emperor, Caligula focused on political and public reform and embarked on a number of construction projects, including two great aqueducts to bring fresh water into the city of Rome. In AD 39, relations between Caligula and the Senate deteriorated, and Caligula's actions as emperor were described in the ancient sources as being especially harsh towards the Senate and the nobility. And he also had several members of his extended family killed, believing that people were plotting and conspiring against him. The situation escalated in AD 40, when Caligula announced to the Senate that he planned to leave Rome and move to Egypt, where he hoped to be worshipped as a living god. Eventually, officers from the Praetorian Guard, the Imperial Bodyguard, assassinated Caligula, his wife, and their daughter Drusilla in AD 41, and declared his uncle, brother of Germanicus, Claudius, the new emperor. And here we have a cameo portrait of Claudius, the first emperor to be born outside Italy. He was born in Gaul, where his father was on a military posting, and he was declared emperor by the Praetorian Guard in AD 41 after his nephew Caligula's assassination. Claudius expanded the imperial bureaucracy to include freedmen, and restored the empire's finances after the excessive spending of Caligula's reign. He was an ambitious builder 
constructing many new roads, aqueducts and canals across the empire, investing in what nowadays we would call infrastructure projects. And during his reign, the Roman Empire started its conquest of Britain. Now, this half gemstone portrait of Claudius would have been used as imperial propaganda. It would have been distributed amongst the elite and small gems such as this would be given by the emperor as a gift to close friends, as a reward or to win support. They usually show an idealized portrait of the emperor, the same image that would have been known to the wider population from coins. Claudius married four times. He divorced his first wife, Paulita. They had a son, but this son died as a teenager. His second wife, he had a daughter, Claudia Antonia with. He later divorced this second wife after the marriage became a political liability. In 38 or early 39 AD, Claudius married his second cousin, Melus Messina, and they had a daughter and a son who were born just, the son who was born just after Claudius became emperor. Now in AD 48, during his reign as emperor, Messina married her lover Gaius in a public ceremony while Claudius was away from Rome. Now, ancient sources disagree as to whether or not she divorced the emperor first and whether the intention was to usurp the throne. Claudius was, however, convinced by advisors that it was a plan to remove him from power. And Melusina was executed by the imperial guard and all statues of her in Rome taken down. Claudius then married his fourth wife, Agrippina, on New Year's Day, AD 49. Now, Agrippina, we have met before. She was the widowed daughter of Claudius's brother, Germanicus, therefore Claudius's niece. And the marriage may, be, may have been part of Agrippina's plan to make her son Nero by her first husband, the next emperor, and persuade Claudius to name her son, who was now Claudius's stepson, as heir instead of Claudius's own son, Britannicus. Claudius died aged 63, and it is reported that in the, in the ancient sources that Agrippina poisoned him in a dish of fancy mushrooms. Here we have an image of Agrippina and below we see the extent to which Agrippina used her marriage to Claudius to consolidate her political power, appearing alongside Claudius on coins issued for circulation within the Roman Empire. The other coin shows us a picture of Claudius's third wife, Melusina, and three, three of his children, Octavia and his son Britannicus, who never succeeded him as emperor, holding hands, and then his daughter Antonia on the far side. When Claudius died, Nero, the son of Agrippina, now widow of Claudius, became emperor at the age of 16. He was Augustus's great, great grandson, descended from the first emperor's only daughter, Julia. Now, he ruled at a time of great social and political change, overseeing events such as Boudicca's rebellion in Britain in AD 60 and the Great Fire of Rome in AD 64. His mother Agrippina, who we see here on an early coin of Nero, 
exerting significant influence over the young emperor's decisions, especially at the beginning of his reign, where he was also guided by leading palace advisors. However, relationships with his mother became strained. He later dismissed her guard and ordered her to leave the palace. Nero built magnificent public baths in Rome, while new building regulations introduced after the Great Fire improved living conditions across the city. By constructing a large covered market and improving connections between Rome and its port at the mouth of the River Tiber, he ensured that Rome had access to imported food. In terms of the wider empire, he stabilised relations with the powerful ancient Iranian Parthian Empire on the Roman Empire's eastern borders through military and diplomatic interventions. Now this portrait, this cameo portrait of Nero, dating to around AD 66, shows him with curly hair, a laurel wreath, and a neck beard that goes around below his chin. Now the first four Roman emperors were all clean shaven in public, and after Nero, the next emperor to have a beard this time a full beard, beard, was not until Hadrian in 117. Now Nero married his first wife, Claudia Octavia, as a political alliance in AD 53. She was the daughter of his predecessor Claudius, and this marriage helped to legitimise Nero's claim to the throne. However, he divorced her in AD 62, and banished her from Rome in order to marry his mistress, Poppia Sabina. During celebrations for the winter festival of Saturnalia, Nero and a freeman at the royal court called Pythagoras were married in a public ceremony. In AD 50, sorry, in AD 65, Pina and her unborn child died probably due to pregnancy complications or during childbirth. And Nero married his third wife next year, AD 66. However, a year later in AD 67, he married a castrated male slave, Sporus, who was said to look exactly like Pina. Sabina, he dressed Sporus in women's clothing and addressed him as the Empress, and they remained together until Nero's death. Nero was initially supported by the Senate, but he later clashed with them. In AD 65, a conspiracy against Nero by the Senator Gaius Gisor led to purges during which a number of prominent Romans were exiled. In AD 68, Bindus, the governor of Gaul, rebelled against Nero and declared his support for another governor, the governor of Spain, Alba. Although Vindus was defeated in battle by troops loyal to Nero, Galba started to gain support from other sectors of the military. And at the same time, Nero lost the support of the wider population in Rome due to grain shortages caused by a rebellious military commander who cut the crucial food supply from Egypt to the capital. So abandoned by the people, declared an enemy of the state by the Senate, Opposed by armed governors from the provinces, Nero tried to flee Rome and eventually committed suicide on the 9th of June, AD 68. And with him, the Julio-Claudian dynasty of emperors came to an end. Well, what happened next? Well, following his death, the imperial throne was seized by Galba, 
governor of Roman Spain. He himself was murdered on the 15th of January the following year by his former supporters, the Praetorian Guards. This led to a period of political instability and civil war known as the Year of the Four Emperors. Galba was followed on the throne by Otho, formerly governor of the province of Lusitania, who had indeed accompanied Galba to Rome and was declared emperor on the same day that Galba was murdered. Otho himself reigned for only three months until he committed suicide on the 16th of April in the face of the threat of renewed civil war as Vitius, commander of the legions on the lower Rhine River, marched his troops towards Rome to claim the imperial throne for himself. Vitius entered Rome and was declared emperor three days after Otho's suicide on the 19th of April. However, his claim to the throne was quickly challenged by legions stationed in the eastern provinces who declared their commander, Vespasian, emperor. Vespasian's troops entered Rome on the 20th of December and Vitius was executed. The next day, the Roman Senate officially declared Vespasian emperor and Vespasian traveled from Egypt to Rome to take the imperial throne. This started the Flavian dynasty, who ruled the Roman Empire from AD 69, the year of the four emperors, through to AD 96. And it encompassed Vespasian, who we see on this gold coin, and his two sons, Titus and Domitian, who ruled after him. After the end of the Flavian dynasty, Imperial Rome continued for 400 years until the eventual division and collapse of what was then the Eastern and Western Roman empires to the West in the AD 400s, to the East, the empire continuing as the Byzantium Empire into the 1400 AD. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you have found our journey through early Rome and the first five emperors interesting. And we now have time for a few questions before the end of our time together. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm sure you've got lots of questions because Catherine covered, covered there was a lot there was a lot of ground covered there. Oh but, goodness, yeah. it is a tangled history. You you can see why um, television programs such as I Claudius were so popular because it's a uh, it's a tangled family history wor worthy of a modern a modern soap opera. Eh? Yeah. You know, EastEnders and Coronation Street have nothing on those early emperors. Yeah, there's a lot of names there to, to digest. So there's we'll also a huge number of names, and the family tree is incredibly complicated um because it the emperors hop up and down in the generations so the fact that by the time you get to claudius you are looking at an emperor who follows the throne who follows on the throne after the reign of his his nephew so this is all the generations move up and down through the first five emperors as well so it it, it is fascinating but complex uh, question here, um, Nero. That wasn't the name he was born with, was it? So, do, do, do we know why he was called Nero? Um, Nero was a common Roman male name. Um, it was the name of other members of the Claudi Julio Claudian family. And what would often happen is that certainly elite children on birth would be given a number of names similar nowadays to the way that a child might receive a first name and then a number of second names and then their family name. Uh, the same conventions existed in P Imperial Rome. So 
emperors would have their family name and very often the name by which we know them, in Nero's case, Nero, um, comes through from the simplification of their name in ancient sources. So Caligula is referred to as Caligula by ancient Roman historians, although it was only his nickname. Um, he was said to dislike the nickname, but we as modern historians usually draw the, the, the easy, the simplest, the most direct way of referring to an emperor um, by the names they are given in the ancient sources. So Nero was one of his names, it was a Roman name and is thus the name by which we know him, although within his family, uh, rather like they say that Queen Elizabeth is known as Lilibet within her family, she's known by her nickname um, within family circles, uh, in terms of public office and recordings of Roman histories, emperors are usually gifted one name by historians. And Augustus is similar because Augustus, his name is not Augustus, his birth name was Octavian, Augustus is actually a title, um, but was the name that he is then given by Roman historians and is thus what we call him. It would be a bit like calling Queen Elizabeth Queen. Queen is her title. Uh, it's not her family name. Um, so, yes, you are correct. Roman emperors often have a number of other names. And the one name that we refer to them by is usually the name given to them in the ancient sources. Excellent. Um, also, can, can you talk a little bit about the, 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 the fire uh, that burnt Rome in AD 64? Retrospectively blamed on Nero, but probably not. Uh, yes, this is, this is another interesting um, relationship that modern history has with the ancient sources in that the main sources for the life of the emperors is a book known as The Life of the Twelve Caesars by the Roman historian Suetonius. And these histories were often written years, sometimes many years, after the reign of the emperors who they are writing about. And therefore we have to be aware within these sources that we are not always aware of what their references are, where do they get the information from, what would nowadays we would call a citation, who did they read, who did they talk to, to write their history, and also the idea that history always has bias. History is written by the victors, history is written by the successful, um, histories that tell a good story are the histories that survive. So with Suetonius, what he is recording about Nero is a view of Nero from the senatorial and the elite classes in Rome who were very badly impacted by Nero's reign and by his actions against them and his extended family due to his paranoia around supposed conspiracies and plots. And therefore, he reflects the fact that they were heartily glad when Nero died and basically trash talked him at his reign. And it's very interesting because within the exhibition at the museum, which opens this month, what we're trying to do is actually redress this idea of the mad, tyrannical Nero by looking at his works within the city his works as an emperor who was looking after the population of Rome, 90% of which were the plebeian class, and that amongst them he was incredibly popular. But the plebeian class do not write the history. The history is written by the elite. And therefore, in a similar way that during the Tudor period, Shakespeare gives a damning portrayal of Richard III, who's declared as the worst king by the Tudor dynasty due to the fact that Henry the, Henry the Seventh had beaten Richard at the Battle of Bosworth and taken his throne, and therefore immediately afterwards has to build the propaganda of him, Henry, being the legitimate and the better king than Richard III. So it is always fascinating reading the ancient sources because what you have to do as a reader is enjoy 
the history, but also the, the literature, the narrative, the myth-making that is built up through that history. Thank you. Uh, if, there, if there are no other questions, I'll just give you a couple of seconds. I think we're going to close it just there. And I'll, uh, any other questions? Nothing. Okay, fine. That's that's good. Okay, we'll close it there. Thank you very much today, Catherine, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Very much look forward to it. Have a nice week. Bye-bye. <laughs>